Hi, Ken. Hello. We are going to to give it a couple of minutes. We'll start right at five, and we'll. Very good. Well, I would everyone. like to be on early to make sure everything's mm -hmm. working. You can see yep. me. Yep, I can see you. And hear me. Yep, I can see you and, and hear you very clearly. Perfect. Very well, how are you doing? Good, good. We're we're continuing in what we've been doing, just working away, trying to to bring good history content to to Westport. <laughs> yes, and how are you doing in the midst of this? Uh, it's day to day. It's a struggle. I think for everyone, it is trying to to stay busy and trying to stay focused. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember if you have any little ones. No, no. Luckily, just just me and my fiance and our cat. <laughs> okay, so that part of the picture is not complicated for you, right? No, no. I'm not having to do any any teaching at home for for any little ones. Yeah, so many of them, friends, family, business colleagues are mm -hmm. really dealing with that, and it's such a level of stress that yeah. um, I, I'm very, very. Very <laughs> cognizant of it and very sympathetic to it. So yes, very, very. It sounds oh, it it sounds like such a challenge to to be doing uh, uh, what a lot of people are doing of working full time and also trying to teach and, right. and just juggle all of these things. But. And how are things in Westport? Is it relatively calm there, or is it is it has was it a hot spot? I know, you know, there have been a bunch of hot spots in Connecticut. Yeah, Westport was one of them. Um, I know that our uh, our town government and our officials uh, closed town very quickly. Um, they closed schools very quickly. So we we were very lucky that we uh, we responded very very quickly. Um, We've actually been doing, and I, I know that some people are, are logging in and attending, so welcome if you're joining us. We will begin right at five o'clock. Um, but uh, the museum has actually been doing an oral history project with West Porters, uh, asking them to share their stories um, of how they're, they're handling the, the, quarantine, the quarantine and everything that's happening. Um, and everyone has responded that it is a challenge, but that they're, uh, They've been really pleased with the response by the town officials and by Connecticut as a whole. So good. We've been we've been really pleased. And how is it in New York? Well, um, I have to say we are among the most lucky. Um, my mm -hmm. wife and I we're we're at home together. We have everything we need. Uh, our biggest sorrow is the inability to hold our grandchildren and see them. Mm -hmm. Uh, they actually lived in Manhattan and they relocated um, to their previous home in Maine. So um, we couldn't have seen them if they were in Manhattan anyway. So it doesn't matter if they're 15 minutes away or eight hours away, but um, that's still the tough part. But um, we're in a, a neighborhood of New York that's the West Village, which is quiet and eerily quiet, I, I would say. You know, nothing is open. We have one supermarket a few other shops here and there are open. A couple of coffee shops have tried to reopen with, you know, just takeout service. But, you know, mm -hmm. we're used to this neighborhood being just crowded with life and tourists and people shopping and going out to restaurants. And it's been a long, a long time. So, yeah. but we feel like um, this is the only way we're getting through this. So we're mm -hmm. obeying the rules. I have all my masks lined up. Uh, I have my gloves. And uh, I, I'd say the hardest part is just not feeling just free to go out and, you know, mm -hmm. go out and walk that you have to gear up like you're going for surgery. So, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. That's good. We I are. think we're doing as well as, as we can during. No, as I said, we feel very, very fortunate. That's why mm -hmm. we're very happy to open our windows every night at seven and, and <laughs> clap. As New Yorkers are doing, I don't know if you know about the seven o'clock clap because we care. <laughs> I have. I've seen um, some yeah. posts about it, which has been just it, great. It's pretty amazing. We see people on the roofs of 
buildings around us and at their windows and on their balconies. It's, it's pretty it's nice. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I think we are going to get started. It's 501. So first, I would like to welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name, which you can see in my, my lovely little uh, bubble on my window, is Nicole Carpenter. I'm the Director of Programs and Education at the Westport Museum for History and Culture here in Westport, Connecticut. Uh, at the museum tonight, we are pleased to offer our free programming with our lovely author, Kenneth Davis. Uh, we do, of course, for all of our programs, uh, offer them to you all for free, but we do ask you to support the museum however you can during this difficult time. Um, and we thank you so much for your continued support um, that we've already received and that we will receive in the future. So thank you. We'd also like to remind you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Westport History and at Westport History Museum, respectively. That is where you can be notified in the future of our upcoming programs. So for tonight, we would first like to welcome Kenneth Davis. Uh, Kenneth is a historian and author. He's also the author of the Don't Know Much About History and the resulting series. Uh, he has spoken at the National Council for the Social Studies and the regional social studies conferences in multiple states, including here in Connecticut. Kenneth has also appeared on multiple radio and media outlets, including NPR and CNN. And he's written for multiple publications, including the New York Times and Smithsonian Magazine. Last year, we were very fortunate uh, to have Kenneth join us as a part of our programming for our exhibit, Remembered the History of African Americans in Westport, where we partnered with the Staples High School uh, so we thank you for that. Uh, that exhibit is also still available on our website. In October, I believe, so long as it hasn't been delayed, uh, Kenneth is putting out a new book called Strong Man. I see it on his shelf there. Yes. The Rise of Five Dictators and the Fall of Democracy. But Kenneth join us, joins us tonight to speak about More Deadly Than War. So I'm going to turn it over to, to you, Kenneth. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate the welcome. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. We'd all, I'm sure, much rather do this together in person and be able to enjoy each other's company. But um, these are indeed strange times. Uh, first of all, I would also add a, a special note of local importance in terms of my biography. I'm an honorary member of the Staples School Rho Kappa Society. Now, Rho Kappa is an honor society for social studies and history. And I was inducted uh, a couple of years ago when I made a visit to the Staples School and um, I have some lovely friends who are teachers there. They're among my, um, my best friends of, in the teaching world. And, uh, and I have enormous admiration for what teachers do, and especially right now what they are doing. Uh, I know if you have children at home, uh, or you maybe have grandchildren and you know about what's going on in their school lives, it's an extremely challenging time. Uh, for parents and students, but it's a very challenging time for teachers who have to adjust to this new world of teaching remotely. Uh, it's one thing for me to do this for an 45 minutes or an hour uh, every once in a while. It's another thing to try and think about how teachers are doing this day in and day out with groups of children, I'm sure, virtually herding cats. So. Um, and this is a shout out to our teachers and, and the amazing job that they do uh, and the amazing uh, lengths they go to, um, to make school meaningful for their children. And I know a lot of history teachers who do that, and I'm sure it applies to all teachers as well. So uh, I have nothing but admiration for, for school teachers, and uh, uh, we should be thinking about them more and honoring the work they do all the time, not just in the midst of a crisis. But here we are in the midst of a crisis. And what I'd like to do, uh, Nicole, if it's okay with you, is talk a little bit about um, the history of the Spanish flu and World War I, because you can't separate them, and talk a little bit then about what's different from 102 years ago and what's the same. What are the lessons that we can take out of hearing about the worst pandemic in American history 
and the worst pandemic in world history since the Black Plague of the Middle Ages. Um, it's an extraordinary story, and I think it does have some very important lessons for us. Uh, I wrote the book More Deadly Than War two years ago in uh, marking the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu and the end of World War I. And when I spoke about it then, two years ago, and, and did presentations like this, inevitably people would ask me, can it happen again? Um, here we are two years later, of course, and uh, it hasn't happened to the degree, of course, of the Spanish flu, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but we are in the midst of a global pandemic and certainly the worst one in 100 years. Um, so just for some broad introduction, the Spanish flu, as it came to be known, uh, it was not called that initially, and it didn't come from Spain. I'll talk about that in a minute. The Spanish flu started in the United States in March, maybe earlier of 1918. Uh, continued for several months, slacked off, came back again in a second wave in September of 1918, and went into a very, very deadly phase, fell off again, and then came back in a third wave in the winter and early spring of 1919. In a little more than a year then, 675,000 Americans died of the flu and flu-related complications. And that's an extraordinary number by any measure. At the time, the population of the United States was about one-third what it is today. So if we wanted to just do some quick math and multiply nearly 700,000 people by three, we'd be talking about more than two million people dying of the flu. Of course, that's an extraordinary number. The numbers, this was a pandemic, so the numbers around the world are even more astonishing, staggering. 50 million, perhaps 100 million. We don't really know the full extent uh, of it. 50 million to 100 million died in the Spanish flu, great pandemic of 1918 and 1919. One reason, of course, that it was so deadly is that it came during the midst of World War I. And you can't really talk about the Spanish flu without talking about World War I. And you can't really discuss the end of World War I the last year without discussing the flu. As I mentioned, the flu began in the United States uh, and the first recorded accounts, and we don't know where it really started, the first recorded accounts were in army camps. Uh, of course, World War I had started in August of 1914, the warring countries, primarily Germany and its allies against Great Britain and France and Russia and its allies. The war went on for three years without the American getting involved. The United States finally declares war on Germany in April of 1917 and is woefully unprepared to go to war. So they spend the next year practically getting enough troops ready to go to battle. It took a full year to get enough manpower ready to send them to Europe. But around the time that the first troops were ready to go to Europe, the first signs of an influenza epidemic started to hit some of the army camps where young men had gone off to train. These camps were all over the country. In one of them in particular in Kansas, about 50,000 soldiers crowded together, barracks, tents, wintertime, and the flu hit. At first, they thought, it's just the flu. And you would hear that time and time again, it's just the flu. But then they started to see a remarkable number of these otherwise healthy young men, farm boys in many cases, who had reported for duty and were training, knocked flat on their backs when some were dying from influenza. Very, very unusual. And their death was particularly gruesome. They were racked by uh, very high fevers, body aches, extreme pain, uh, pain so they had to really lay down, you couldn't stand up. And then uh, they began to turn blue. They began to turn blue because they weren't getting enough of oxygen into the lungs. This is a medical term called kyanosis. Um, that's one of the reasons that the first name for the Spanish flu was actually the Purple Death. Uh, this was, uh, baffling to doctors. Why was what looked like 
the normal flu, killing otherwise healthy young men in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, they didn't have an answer to that. The problem was that those young men, for the most part, then went to other training camps or other bases because it was the army getting ready to go to war, or they were put on railroad cars, again, packed together. Then they were put on ships. Those ships carried them over to France. By May of 1918, one million young American soldiers, doughboys as they were known, had landed in France. Many of them were carrying the flu virus. It soon exploded all over Europe. It was such an extent, for instance, that the German army couldn't mount an offensive in, the Ju in June of 1918 because half a million German soldiers were sick with the flu. The British uh, fleet couldn't sail because so many soldiers were sick. 200,000 soldiers were sick on the, German and, uh, on the French and British side. So without saying it changed the outcome of the war, it certainly changed the conduct of the war in the spring of 1918. Then it seemed to slack off, but then in September, it came back with a vengeance. And that's a very important lesson for us to keep in mind today. The, uh, the, the, the usual typical flu season ended, it went away, but by early September, it was back. It came back more violent, more virulent, more deadly, uh, more contagious than ever. And even so, the United States continued to prepare to send troops to France, where the great last offensive of the war was getting underway in September of 1918. So these two things are completely linked together. The course of the flu spreading around the world, it was the first global conflict, and that's why one of the reasons it became a global pandemic. And there was no place on Earth, maybe save Antarctica, uh, uh, that was spared from the ravages of the Spanish flu. I should probably stop here and explain the name because it's also related to the war. Spain in 1918 was not fighting in World War I. And of course, they didn't call it World War I then. Spain was a neutral nation. It was a non-combatant. So when the Madrid uh, tr streetcars get shut down and the King of Spain gets uh, sick, Spanish newspapers were not censored the way newspapers in the fighting nations were censored. So it was the first place that word of a real epidemic in Europe was mentioned. A mysterious ailment had struck Madrid. Well, because of that one newspaper report about this ailment in Madrid, the English-speaking world came to call it the Spanish flu. The Spanish, by the way, called it the Naples soldier. The Germans called it the Russian pest. The Russians called it the Chinese fever. Uh, in other places, it had different names. So just as we are somewhat arguing today over what to call the coronavirus or COVID-19, as it is widely known, um, it had a political uh, uh, resonance back then as well. Throughout history, people have always tried to blame their neighbors or an enemy for a disease. As the war progresses, the flu progresses in the United States. It gets worse and worse and worse through the fall of 1918. Eventually, as I said, killing 675,000 Americans. Of course, this is going on while the war effort is going on. So even though the doctors are saying, shut down the army camps, quarantine the camps, don't allow any more soldiers to go to Europe, the generals, General Pershing in Europe and President Wilson kept the war effort going. Another important part of the war effort when it comes to the flu is something called liberty loans, war bonds. During World War I, the United States was paying for the cost of the war by selling war bonds. They were known as liberty loans. There had been successive drives, one, two, three. In September, they began the fourth liberty loan drive. They wanted it to be the big one. And I have to point out here that this wasn't just a casual thing that somebody might decide to buy a bond the way you might invest a little money in a, a treasury bond. This was a full-scale marketing, publicity, 
public relations and propaganda campaign that wanted to make every American pay their part in the war effort. So they sent around men to movie theaters, YMCA halls, uh, meeting halls, churches, offices. These men would come in and deliver a four minute speech. They were called four minute men. And they made it very clear that if you were patriotic and you were doing your duty, you would buy a war bond. Well, part of the promotion of these bonds was to have big parades. And cities like Boston, uh, New York, and Philadelphia all planned big parades around their fourth Liberty Loan Drive. Even though they knew, especially in Philadelphia, that the flu was around, it was on some of the military bases, it was in the factories, the war factories that were filling these, uh, being filled with thousands of workers. They knew it was going on, but they went on with that parade. 200,000 people march in the streets of Philadelphia on September 28, 1918. Two days later, every hospital bed in Philadelphia was filled. And soon about 15,000 people died in Philadelphia. They tried to shut the city down. They closed the hotels, the bars, the pool halls, eventually the churches and the schools, but it was too little too late. Other cities watched what Philadelphia had done, a city like St. Louis, for instance, and they did the opposite. They closed things down before the flu really hit. They flattened the curve, as we would say today. They used social distancing, as we would say today. So these things were all done in 1918, just as we are seeing them done today. The other big thing that was done in 1918, I'll just show you the cover of my book, Nor Deadly Than War. You can see these two newsboys wearing the masks. The mask was widely uh, used in 1918. Some cities demanded it. Uh, San Francisco, for instance, you couldn't go anywhere without a mask. You would be fined. You were called a mask slacker if you didn't wear it. Um, in fact, in fa San Francisco was very effective in the first wave. Then they had a second wave and people didn't want to wear the masks and the in uh, infections went up, the deaths went up. Very good lesson again for us today. So there are so many aspects of the Spanish flu and World War I that do come together that that's why I say you need to talk to them, uh, uh, talk about them side by side. You can't split them up. Uh, but finally, I'll, I'll say one thing, which is what can we really take about uh, from this, this period and some of the lessons that were learned? And then I would like to take any questions that uh, you and the audience might have about this extraordinary moment in our history. Um, I think there are three really central lessons that I would emphasize from 1918 that apply to us today. The first is that lies, propaganda, and censorship are very dangerous. They certainly contribute, all contributed to the spread of the flu in 1918. Um, the lies were as simple as telling people when they knew it wasn't true that it was just the flu. Or they would say, this is going to just stay in the military, you don't have to worry about it. And these were medical people making these statements because they didn't want people to panic. Um, censorship was also important. Newspapers were either officially censored or sometimes self-censoring. They didn't want to put so much bad news about the flu in the newspapers when they were, people were really interested in reading about the war. And finally, propaganda. Uh, people were told quite openly by people in the health department of the United States that this might be a German weapon that U-boats had brought spies over and they'd poisoned the water supply or that Bayer aspirin had been tainted. Just to remind you, Bayer aspirin was invented by Ger a German company early in the century. It was a wonder drug. It's about the only drug doctors had at the time to treat influenza. So people were afraid to use aspirin. Bayer actually took out ads in this country saying it was made in America by Americans. So lies, censorship, propaganda can kill. That's one lesson. The second lesson is also very closely related to that, and that's that ignoring science can be very deadly. In 1918, 
Some scientists were warning not to go, allow crowds. Others were warning to shut down army camps. Others were saying, don't allow these soldiers to go on these ships. But the war effort took precedence over the scientists' warnings. And that's the last point. We have to remember how important it is to keep priorities in order. In 1918, the priorities for Woodrow Wilson, the president, and John Pershing, who got the flu himself, he was the commander in Europe, the priority was winning the war and at whatever cost. And even if that cost meant ignoring science in terms of the public health. So that's a really important lesson, I think, for us today as we're grappling this with this terrible question of an economy that's clearly very uh, broken, uh, but a public health disaster that is taking tens of thousands of lives. What comes first? Do we put the economy first or do we put the public health first? Personally, if anyone asks me, I would say I would go for the public health over the economy. We can always bring the economy back, but we can't bring people back. So with that, Nicole, I'm going to take a breath, take a drink of water, and ask if any, there are any questions for me. If anyone has any questions, um, feel free to enter them in the chat or in the question and answer. Um, I am monitoring those right now, if you have any. I do have some for you, Ken. Um, just while we're, we're waiting for um, some of our audience participation. Um, so you were discussing uh, with Woodrow Wilson, and I was curious what, uh, you said that he took uh, the stance of winning the war first, and I was wondering what his government recommendations for um, battling the flu were, if there were any messages that were sent out other than uh, the war first. Had to find my mute <laughs> button. I couldn't uh, grab it. We're all getting used to Zoom. Uh, it's a great question. It's an important question. First of all, I'd back up a little bit and say, when we think of the federal government, of course, we're thinking of it in very modern terms, of this massive bureaucracy with lots of departments. The federal government in 1918 was very different. As I mentioned, there was, uh, even when there was a declaration of war, America was unready. We had a very small army about 100,000 men. All of a sudden they were gonna need 4 million men. So that's why this was a real crash course. Um, there was no CDC. There was no National Institute of Health. There was no Health and Human Services Department. There was no, uh, uh, you know, go down the list of departments that we have in the cabinet. Uh, they just didn't exist then. The federal government was much smaller in 1918 than it would be until well into the depression when uh, in, in response to the depression, the federal government ramped up uh, its size and so many agencies. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, most people had only one connection to the federal government in 1918 and that's getting their mail delivered. Of course, there was no social security uh, in, in 1918. All those things were to come. So it was a very different government and it was, fixed single-mindedly on the question of the war, as I said. So finally, Congress appropriates some money to, uh, in, in, the, in the fall of 1918 to try and uh, do something about this, but um, it's really woefully little. And about all the federal government does is print up some pamphlets. And the pamphlets were sort of the basic advice of eat well, avoid crowds, cover your coughs and sneezes, I should also point out here that they did not know what caused influenza in 1918. No one had ever seen a virus. They had the word virus, that it was a theoretical word, but they couldn't see one because it's too small to be seen by the microscopes of the time. Bacteria had been seen for decades, and so people understood bacteria, but they didn't understand there could be something infinitesimally smaller than bacteria that was causing so many problems. Viruses are very, very small, and a sneeze contains billions of viruses. Um, so that's why we need to cover and cough and wash our hands. Uh, 
which by the way, two years ago when I wrote the book and I was lecturing at schools, I would always finish every lecture with two words, hand washing. And now we all know uh, certainly how important that is. So the federal response was very muted, partly because the government was small. There was no real public health agency uh, except for the U.S. Public Health Department, which was really concerned at that point with getting doctors and nurses ready for war. There was a real shortage of nurses and doctors to begin with because of the war, and the flu epidemic only made it worse. And of course, then many of the doctors and nurses started to fall ill themselves. So it was a terrible, terrible period. Uh, difficult for us to uh, fathom, although seeing what we've seen in some of the hospitals gives us a sense of how the crisis might have been. Um, but the, the medicine was so far behind back then, and the government response was so different. It was really left up to local health departments to solve these problems. We have a question from Sarah um, about the newspapers and self-censoring. Uh, self and how would they disseminate this information? How could the public distinguish between um, what we would call fake news today or the truth? How, how is that censorship kind of um, perceived by the public? Uh, that's a good question. You know, you go back and look at the newspapers of the day, and I'm talking more about the local newspapers or the regional newspapers of the day. There's much more of a sense of, I guess, boosterism to them. Uh, so they were concerned really about the war effort and they were concerned about, you know, the, the status of local boys who were in the war. And people did really want to follow the news of the war very carefully, especially in the fall when the flu was mounting its, its big second wave, but also the great offensive of World War I was underway. It was called the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, one of the most famous battles in uh, World War I history, um, and one of the largest battles in World War I history and all of history. So that was really what the newspapers were fixed on because, again, the war effort was the most important thing, and that's what they thought their readers were interested in. So if there was flu news uh, or, you know, mentions of the flu, it was often put towards the back of the paper. In fact, when Philadelphia has this big outbreak that I mentioned, the newspapers are very critical of the health department for shutting the city down. They think, well, this is just going to cause panic. Uh, we, sh we shouldn't have these kind of quarantines. And we're hearing the same arguments today that we heard then. People wanted to keep their cities open. They said, oh, if you shut the city down, it will, it will, it will destroy our businesses. So that was the kind of driving force for a lot of the newspapers in 1918. It wasn't so much the heavy hand of the government telling them what to say as a kind of self-censorship, a kind of local boosterism, and the fear that they were going to uh, drive businesses out. And of course, businesses were their advertisers. So um, the, those kind of uh, uh, considerations always enter into a newspaper publisher's judgment. We have another question from Marsha, and she says uh, her understanding was that the flu affected people in their early 20s more than older people. And did the public know that? And then the second part of her question is also, did that inspire sympathy? Uh, and then there is an author, Mary McCarthy, who lost her parents from the flu, and didn't some people care that children were being orphaned? Really good questions, and I discuss all of those things in more deadly than war, so I'm, I'm glad we're able to, to uh, uh, thank you for those questions. Um, first of all, to the point of the unusual aspect of this flu killing otherwise healthy people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, as opposed to the very elderly and the very young, which we think of as the most uh, prone to, uh, to suffering in an influenza outbreak. Uh, what, that was one of the real mysteries, somewhat still unresolved about the Spanish flu. The predominant theory today is that the, the influenza was so powerful and it attacked the uh, respiratory system so powerfully that the immune system sent 
a really powerful uh, anti-immune, uh, uh, I, I should say, immune reaction to try and defeat this virus. And I'm not a, a, a medical expert and I'm not a scientist. So I'm going to really put this down to the most basic steps. Essentially what was happening because um, the powerful immune systems were sending fluids to the lung to try and flush out the virus, those fluids essentially end up suffocating, choking people to death because the lungs were filled with fluid. It's essentially what pneumonia is, except this was an extraordinary and extreme case. And it seems like the healthier, younger and healthier you were, the stronger you were, the more vi virulent the reaction to the virus was. Uh, that's the explanation that, as I understand it, of the, the death of young people. And so it was an unusual thing. And that's one of the things that, that made this flu so, so dreadful and so frightening, on top of the fact that tens of thousands of Americans were dying in the battlefield right then at the same time. So you have these twin catastrophes going on at the same time. Yes, indeed, whole families were destroyed. Many uh, orphans were created. There were horrific stories of uh, uh, health workers walking into buildings and tenements in Philadelphia, for instance, and finding a, ch a child left with uh, 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 two dead parents in the, in the room. So really awful scenes that sound like something that come out of the Middle Ages and the Black Death. Um, you mentioned, uh, the, the questioner mentioned Mary McCarthy. That's exactly right. She wrote a book called uh, uh, Memories of a Catholic Girlhood or Memoir of a Catholic Girlhood. I mentioned it in, uh, the, uh, in my book. She describes being taken, her, her parents, uh, she grew up in Seattle. Seattle was a, a seacoast town, a port city, and all port cities were very, very prone to being vectors, hot zones, because anytime a ship came in with sailors or crew that were sick, the dock workers got it from them, brought it out into the neighborhood. So um, in Seattle, they get on the train to go to the Midwest to escape the flu in Seattle. And while they're on the train, a conductor thinks that the, uh, they might be sick, and he actually tries to force Mary McCarthy's parents off the train out in the middle of North Dakota or somewhere. And her father actually, she says in the book, pulls out a gun and they finish the trip. But both parents then do die. And Mary McCarthy is sent off to live with an aunt and uncle who um, were not so, uh, so nice. Uh, and that's part of the story of her Catholic girlhood. Um, so th these were very, very typical stories that's another interesting point, though, because besides Mary McCarthy and one short story by uh, a writer named Catherine Ann Porter, who was a newspaper writer in Denver and survived the Spanish flu, there's very, very little literature, either fiction or nonfiction, written about the Spanish flu, either during the flu or shortly thereafter. It really is something, and that's one of the reasons I call this the hidden history of the Spanish flu. It's something that got left out of the popular imagination. There is no great play, there's no great movie, there are no great novels about the Spanish flu, very few references to it other than uh, McCarthy, very few poems written about it. Robert Frost had it. He doesn't write, uh, I mean, it may have affected some of his, his poetry later, uh, there's a single poem that I know called The Contagion Hospital, uh, that mentions The Contagion Hospital by um, Wallace Stevens, I think it is, and who was a doctor and went to the Contagion Hospitals. And he mentions that just in a single line in one poem. So this really did get washed out, written out of the popular memory. And the suggestion is that it was just so terrible, people didn't want to talk about it, think about it, acknowledge it after it was over. They just wanted to get on with their lives. So it's a fascinating piece of the sociology of the time. And I wonder if someone is writing right now, you know, the great novel of this pandemic. I'm reminded of that uh, I'm, I'm actually reading is a pretty thick one. This is um, Boccaccio's Decameron, which is one of the great masterpieces of literature that comes out of the Black Plague. 
Um, in it, Boccaccio tells of 10 people who will go off to get us away from Florence, and each of the 10 people tells a story on each of 10 nights. So it's a collection of 100 stories that are all based on living together, being in quarantine, being in lockdown together. So I don't know, maybe somewhere somebody's in lockdown together and they're creating a new Decameron. I certainly hope so. That would be wonderful. Uh, we do have a, uh, a comment from Denise. She says, or she shares that her grandmother's first husband was an immigrant and a cook at Fort Devens in Massachusetts and ultimately passed from the Spanish flu. And she's curious whether uh, you believe that the Spanish flu may have had this resurgence in the US from soldiers returning from World War I, if that might have been part of that resurgence of the flu. Uh it certainly was related to the back and forth between uh, Europe and uh, the United States during the flu. So those sailors, uh, let me back up a minute. The real outbreak in the United States comes about in late August of 1918, and it starts in Boston with a bunch of sailors who get off the, uh, a ship in, uh, in Boston uh, at Commonwealth Pier. And it, this was where it became so contagious and so rapid. The spread was like wildfire throughout Boston. And Camp Devons or Fort Devons, which the uh, questioner mentioned, is about 30 miles from Boston. And that became one of the real hot zones of the Spanish flu in September of 1918. So um, it wasn't so much soldiers returning because most of the soldiers were still in Europe. The offensive was going on. It wasn't like they were uh, coming back home. Anybody who was over there was staying there for the duration. So there might have been somebody who was wounded coming back, but most soldiers who were in Europe were staying there. But there were sailors coming back and forth. There were sh uh, supply ships coming back and forth. Um, a fellow named Franklin D. Roosevelt is the Under Secretary of the Navy. He comes back to Europe, uh, from Europe, he's uh, inspecting the troops in France. He comes back and is very sick on a very famous ship called the Leviathan. So Franklin D. Roosevelt, as a fairly young man, Under Secretary of the Navy, is taken off a ship in New York City by ambulance, uh, taken to his mother's apartment and nearly dies. Think how history would have changed if Franklin D. Roosevelt had not set, survived the Spanish flu. So um, the, the, it wasn't so much soldiers returning as just the back and forth of ships and, and personnel and people who had been in infected areas, but the flu was still here just because it's not like it, it went away and came back. It, it still might have been here and was just kind of smoldering and waiting for the return of what we would think of as peak flu season in the fall. Um, there's no question that the ships that were carrying these men and soldiers and sailors back and forth were one of the real means of transmission. And once those sailors from Boston went out to other ports, they became major super spreaders as well. Uh, they certainly introduced the, the flu into Philadelphia, where there was a real explosion, as I mentioned earlier. They probably took it to New Orleans. They probably took it to San Francisco, uh, up to Canada, and eventually to the West Coast, uh, San Francisco, Seattle. Uh, they probably took it to the largest Navy base at that time, which was the Great Lakes Naval Station outside of Chicago, where sailors were being trained. And it hit there. A hundred men a day were dying in, in uh, Chicago at the Great Lakes, uh, Great Lakes Naval Station. Those people got into the civilian population, San, uh, Chicago being the major hub of the railroads for the whole country, it soon spread out from there. So you could see this, this spread from these major port cities, major military installations going out. And every city that had a major army base nearby usually got hit pretty hard. So there's this clear connection between troops coming back and forth, moving back and forth, and moving around with each other 
and spreading this virus first among themselves and then to the civilian population. Sarah has two questions. Uh, we'll do them one at a time, I think. Uh, one of them was, were organizations like the Red Cross focused on the war effort primarily, or were they involved in efforts of first aid at home as well, uh, doing masks and, and other kinds of aid? Great question. And uh, the, the truth is you can't, again, separate what they were doing. Women who went off to join the Red Cross as nurses or volunteers first went off to roll bandages. In fact, I, there's a photograph in the book of women uh, Red Cross nurses uh, or volunteers uh, rolling bandages, but then they switched to making masks. And so many of the Red Cross nurses who initially were called up when the army announced this extraordinary need for nurses, 25,000 nurses they call, called for initially, um, most of them were thinking they were going into military service, but as the flu ramped up, especially in the fall, many of them were sh shifted over to uh, doing duty as, uh, as uh, flu nurses. Um, and hundreds of them died as well. So this is part of the story as well. And I should also mention here that before 1918, um, nursing was not really a women's profession. It had been in the American Civil War. We think of somebody like Clara Barton. But during the Victorian era of the late 19th century, it wasn't thought to be a job that women should do. Um, women should be at home. Women should uh, certainly have their place. They weren't even especially suited for the harsh business of taking care of sick people Plus, there would be the chance that they might see a man naked. Um, wouldn't that be terrible? So um, in a way, the war combined with the flu really opens up the nurse nursing profession to women. And it's kind of one of the unintended consequences of this whole period is that women's status in American society changed very, very radically after the war and the flu. And I don't think there's any accident that we get the suffrage amendment right after both events happen. These women had gone to battle, they'd gone to the hospitals, they'd been fighting uh, alongside their husbands, they'd been in the factories uh, making the weapons for the war. They were not going to go back and accept the situation as it had been. They were not going back to the status quo. And that's one of the reasons I think that the, uh, that the uh, uh, amendment passes to give women the vote in 1920. And what was the second? Uh, before we move on to the second part of her question, I actually have a follow-up question. It's on my list of, of pre-prepared questions uh, about the suffrage movement. I know um, in reading just in my own background that there were um, uh, many reactions to the suffrage movement during World War I of being unpatriotic to bring up this topic during that time. Were there more effects on the suffrage movement during the, um, during the flu, during the pandemic, during 1918? Uh, again, I think it was, uh, there, there was the reaction that you're, uh, exactly you're, what you're describing. Uh, women who were working for suffrage were seen as somehow unpatriotic. And again, this, there was this time when if you weren't seen as doing your part, uh, it was more than just uh, being, uh, being difficult you were being disloyal. Uh, and, and there were actually people who were going around and checking on everyone's loyalty in 1918. Um, so that's a real uh, sense of uh, uh, fear and paranoia. But you also had women standing in front of the White House with signs that said, if this is a war for democracy, Mr. President, President Wilson, how come we don't have democracy? And that was a very, in the end, a difficult argument. And I think in the end, when women had made the contribution that they had made, that there was not going to be any question that we would go ahead with the uh, suffrage amendment. So I think short term, yes, it, it was a setback to the movement. Um, longer term, it probably changed the status of women. When I say it, I mean the flu and the war and nursing. 
women going to factories, women working in offices, moving to cities, not just going back to the farm, really did re uh, represent a fundamental change in the status of women in American society. Now, the second part of Sarah's question, um, she uh, says first, there is a, a, a phrase, uh, if history doesn't repeat, it runs. Um, and she is curious whether you believe we'll see a second wave of this flu as we did see with the 1918. This is a really important question and it's certainly one of the reasons I think it's so important to understand what happened in 1918, that it did indeed come back and it came back worse in the fall than it had been in the previous spring. Uh, the suggestion is that the, the virus mutated to something that was more deadly than the first strain had been. Uh, viruses do mutate all the time. Uh, I'm getting something of a crash course in, uh, in uh, virology and genetics in the last few weeks reading about it. Some of it's really been fascinating. Um, but th the answer to the question is we don't know. I think it's important to understand that history and be prepared for that eventuality and not take this very optimistic view that has been expressed in very high places that it will go away and that will be the end of it. Um, that is not what the history uh, proves certainly when it comes to 1918 and 1919. That being said, we don't know the answer to that. I know Dr. Fauci uh, has spoken about this. He gave a press uh, interview just last week about this and he's quite certain there will be a second wave in the fall. Whether it will be uh, less or worse is completely a matter of speculation at this point. Um, does the virus mutate in some way? Does the fact that we have now, because it's spread around, there'll be some immunity, this so-called herd immunity, uh, should it come back. That So if you get it, it might not be as bad or you might not get it at all. Those are purely matters of speculation at this time. And, and I'm certainly not going to weigh in on that, but I do think it's something to be very, very mindful of as we go forward. Uh, and not to have this very rosy view that once it's over in the summertime, if it ends in the summertime, um, we will go back to um, uh, normal come September. There is not going to be uh, normal come September. I, I don't know what to expect, for instance, from public schools. Uh, a couple of schools have announced that they are reopening. New York University has, for instance. but. Seems like a lot of that is still up in the air, and I think a lot of it will depend upon what we see happen as the as the fall comes around. Uh, Casey asks, to what extent did the flu affect soldiers on the battlefield, and how was that handled? Were they brought to military hospitals? Uh, yeah, so uh, absolutely, absolutely, it's a very good question. Uh, I'll go back to the first part of it. Um, in the spring phase of the Spanish flu, as I mentioned earlier, clearly had an impact on the conduct of the war. The, the, the British fleet could not sail at a certain point in May of 1918. I mean, that's a pretty big deal in the middle of a war when one whole Navy is kind of taken out of commission. Uh, 200,000 uh, French and British soldiers were reported as uh, on, on sick leave at one point. So it's very hard to you know, have a war when everybody's too sick to fight. That was clearly the case with the German offensive, which was planned in June. And the German general at the time was you know, beside himself that he had so many soldiers sick with what he called Flanders fever. Flanders being one of the very famous battlefields in, uh, in Belgium, France uh, at, the, at the time. So it clearly had an impact in the, uh, on the conduct of the war early on. Um, what happened to the soldiers at the front? Most of them would uh, you know, have to get through it, got through it. Some of them, if they were very sick, would have been removed to field hospitals or maybe taken to a larger hospital. Um, and many of them died. Um, there are, I think, 
in the United States Army, something like 60,000 flu deaths during the war. And there are a hundred, only, a, oh, not only, there are 100,000 war deaths in the United States uh, Army and military in World War I, and 60,000 of them flu deaths. Um, so that's how, why when I say this, this disease was more deadly than war, it certainly was, um, including for many soldiers. And I think for our final question tonight, because we are approaching six o'clock, um, we had an earlier question that I saved until now. Um, Anne asks, why did the flu of 1918 end? And I'd like to add, is there anything um, from the ending of the pandemic in 1918 that we can uh, perhaps learn from any um, steps that were put in place? It's a great question, an important question, and uh, it's somewhat an unresolved, another unresolved question. Essentially, the flu went through, as I mentioned earlier, one, two, three waves that kind of slacked off by the end of winter, uh, spring of 1919. Should also point out it was during the spring of 1919 that Woodrow Wilson himself catches the flu while he's in Paris, while he's negotiating the Versailles Treaty, I write about this in More Deadly Than War, there is a suggestion by many historians that the flu affected Wilson at this critical juncture in world history, and that he changed his mind about certain things that he was going to accept in that uh, final treaty. And those things are, pretty significant when you can consider what the Versailles Treaty meant and what it still continues to mean, of course. So Wilson, um, his doctor, by the way, thought he had been poisoned, he was so sick. And there are people who would have probably been happy to see Wilson uh, removed from the scene. So that's a pretty impressive idea to think about how this flu might have influenced the ripples of history going out from there. As I mentioned also earlier, Franklin D. Roosevelt survives it. Imagine how history would have changed if Franklin D. Roosevelt did not live through the Spanish flu into the Great Depression and then World War II. Uh, another survivor I mentioned in the book is a young man who wound, wanted to go off to war. Uh, he was too young to be a soldier. They let him be an ambulance driver, Red Cross ambulance driver. Um, he got sick before he went to war and came home, almost died. His name is Walt Disney. Um, how would history have changed if Walt Disney had not survived? So these are kind of the interesting human pieces of this extraordinary uh, drama. But the answer to the big question is, well, how did it end? The suggestion is that like most flu seasons, it just went away because it kind of used up all the av available fuel. It's, the best comparison I have is to a forest fire. A forest fire burns until there's no more wood. And when the wood is all gone, all the fuel is gone, the fire, fire dies away. That's sort of what happens with the Spanish flu. It eventually peters out. There's no more available uh, uh, bodies for it to infect, and it eventually goes away. Could weather patterns have something to do with it? Absolutely. But viruses eventually do peter out, and they are replaced the next year by a different strain. We know that the viruses come back every year um, and they're, they're different, they're different strains. And we have vaccines that have to be manufactured to, uh, to work for the anticipated strain that's going to uh, affect most people. So that's the, the main thought about how this thing ends. So there was really no cure, there was no treatment, there was no vaccine then. Uh, flu vaccines wouldn't come until the 1940s. Um, so very little to do other than just see it disappear, and it eventually did. Um, the, the best and the most important lessons, I think, are some of those that I spoke about lately, uh, earlier, and that's really listening to this advice about social distancing, hand washing, masking in public, uh, and being very careful in terms of our own health and sanitation. Eating well, good rest, plenty of liquids. Those are very old fashioned ideas, but they are the best ideas that we have for 
combating this in terms of not getting sick, that's the best thing to do as opposed to being able to treat it in any way. I want to thank you for joining us tonight, Ken. Thank you so much. It was so fascinating. Um, would you tell everyone where they can uh, buy the book? Yes, I, I'd like to tell them to go to their bookstore, their local bookstore. They're all closed for the most part. But uh, most of the booksellers that I know of have, in, uh, have online sales. So you can go to your local uh, bookseller, uh, certainly all the other online. If you go to my website, which is don'tknowmuch.com, I have some buy buttons there where you can find uh, the, the book from uh, independents or some of the big online booksellers. And I will also mention, you mentioned it, but I'll reiterate that I'm very excited about this book coming in October. It's called Strong Man, The Rise of Five Dictators in the Fall of Democracy. Um, also a very timely subject. Um, talks about the rise of, for instance, Hitler and Mussolini, how they, right after this crisis, used the crisis of the flu and World War I in a way to gain power in their countries. And we hear this uh, phrase, democracy dies in darkness. I'm going to tell you it does not die in darkness. It dies in broad daylight, often with thousands of people, sometimes millions of people cheering. And that's a very, very uh, dangerous and scary story that we should be aware of. So thanks for inviting me. I hope that next time that I talk to you, it will be in person. And um, I just wish everybody to stay safe, uh, obey the rules, uh, stay home, and be well. Thank you very much, Nicole. You're very welcome. Everyone pick up Ken's book. Um, definitely give it a read. And if you have read it, please send us a review. We would love to uh, include it on our uh, virtual site. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Ken. And have a wonderful evening. Thanks so much. Goodbye, everybody, and stay well.